Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go through section 2.1 titled Matrix Operations. Uh, chapter 2 is all about matrix algebra. Um, and we begin the, the chapter by showing how um, we talk about matrices in a general sense. So we've, we've mentioned in chapter 1, you know, we have rows and columns. This is the rows, these are the columns. And so when we identify uh, the locations within a matrix, we use a lowercase a and then a pair of subscripts. Okay, so row I, that's the first subscript. Column J, that's the second subscript. So A11 means that I'm in the first row, first column. A13 means first row, third column. A32 means third row, second column. Okay, and so like, and then in an infinite sense, we throw the dot, dot, dots on there, A1N for the nth column, and then going down, AMN for the, the bottom right location in my M by N matrix. All right, so that's just the way that we write matrices in a general sense. And then we refer to the diagonal entries as the entries on the main diagonal, and that is the A11, A22, A33, etc., from top left down to bottom right. And then a diagonal matrix, this is another little definition built into this blurb here, is a square matrix whose non-diagonal entries are zero. So there's another definition there. Uh, an example is the identity n by n. Uh, Th that is an example of a diagonal matrix. And then any matrix who's got zeros everywhere is uh, called a zero matrix, zeros everywhere, all right? The first main topic in this section is that of sums and scalar multiples. Um, the text defines, but I didn't write down, or I didn't put it in here, you know, what it means for two matrices to be equal, right? If they have identical uh, size and then every entry is the exact same, right? That hopefully makes sense. Um, sums and scalar multiples work as we would hope they would. Um, if I am adding two matrices, we add corresponding entries. Scalar multiple, a scalar multiplies by every entry. So uh, we'll start out here. I've got three matrices at the top. Let's say what is um, A plus B. So I'm just going to rewrite my matrix A, 4, negative 1, 0, 3, 5, 2, plus my B matrix, 1, 1, 1, 3, 5, 7. And we add corresponding entries, which I'm just going to highlight the first pair um, and then hopefully it's okay from there. So when we find that sum, we get 5, and then 1, and then 6, 2, 8, 9. There we go. Okay, so that's A plus B. Um, and then if I were to say, all right, what about when you add A plus C? We say that, is, that sum is not defined. Not defined. Okay, and the reason it's not defined is because matrix A and matrix C have different uh, sizes. Two matrices have to be the same size if I am going to um, add them together, or subtract them for that matter. And then um, just to get into scalar multiples also, if I want to, let's say, take matrix B and multiply it by a scalar of 3, 3 times matrix B is 3 times every entry in this matrix, so three times, that's an equal sign, three times one is three, three, three going across the top, nine, 15, 21 across the bottom. So that scalar multiple multiplies by everything uh, that's in that matrix. Theorem one here is a list of properties for matrix, uh, or for sums and scalar multiples of matrices. These are hopefully familiar, but anytime we introduce a new topic in math, typically we talk about its properties. So, right, if I have two matrices, or three matrices that are all the same size, R and S are my scalars, right? Addition of matrices is commutative. That's good. Uh, it doesn't matter what order we add in. Uh, the associative property holds with matrices. Additive identity, still zero. Uh, if I'm multiplying a scalar times a sum, I can distribute that scalar in. Uh, or if I have a sum of scalars times a matrix, I can distribute that matrix into the sum. Uh, and then the associative property with my scalar multiplication, that also applies. Okay, so that's just saying that, yes, all these things that you've heard of in the past, uh, associative identity, etc., those still apply to sums and scalar multiples with matrices. 
In the second example, or it's called example three apparently, uh, we're going to look at how matrix multiplication works. We're going to find the product A times B. Up until this point, we've only multiplied a matrix times a vector, okay? And that was in, in, in earlier in chapter one. Now what happens when I multiply, or can I multiply, a matrix times another matrix? Well, the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you a more drawn out way uh, to start out with, and then we'll have a more simplified uh, technique a little bit later in this um, uh, in this video. There we go. So I'm going to define my matrix B as a set of column vectors, B1, B2, B3. And then I'm going to take, all right, what is a, a, whoops, what is A times B1? What is AB1? Well, now I'm taking 2, 1, 3, negative 5 times, times the first column, 4, 1, and then AB2, matrix A again, 2, 1, 3, negative 5, times the second column of B, 3, negative 2, and A, B, 3, 2, 1, 3, negative 5, times the third column, 6, 3, the third column of B. All right, and we've done each of these smaller products previously. I'm just going to write down what the answers, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one, right? We take row and column. 8 plus 3 is usually 11, and then we take row and column. Uh, 4 minus 5 is negative 1. So I'm going to write down what you would get multiplying the other two columns. Pause the video if you want to and um, do it yourself. And the last one is 21, negative 9. Okay, so we've, we've looked at that previously in chapter one. Now we put it together. When I multiply these two matrices, I just take the rows of A and go through each column of B, right? So the product A times B is equal to 11, negative 1, 0, 13, and 21, negative 9. Just putting those three, uh, th those three columns back together as a single matrix. And then kind of interesting like fact here that each column in the product, each of these columns, is a linear combination of the columns of matrix A using weights from the corresponding column of matrix B. Just some kind of, I find it kind of interesting. Um, that's how that product works, okay? Uh, but one thing that is really, really, really important, and I'm going to write it down here, at the bottom um, is that each column of a uh, uh, the number of columns and the number of rows m matters in the in the A's and the B's. So the number of columns, the number of columns of A must match has to be the same as must match the number of rows of B. in order for this product to be defined. It matters. So going back up to the top, A had one, two columns, B has one, two rows. So if I were to write down the size of those two matrices, two by two, these are the columns, and uh, two by three, these are the rows. The twos in the middle, this two and this two, have to be the same in order for my product to be defined. Kind of going off of that then, if I have a three by five matrix A and a five by two matrix B, is their product defined A, B, B, A, right in both orders? Well, if it's A times B, then I have three by five and five by two. Columns, rows, match, yes. If I do B, times a, uh, that's 5 by 2, and we're multiplying by 3 by 5, 2, 3, no. That product is not defined. So what the, the like bigger pi uh, picture of that is, is that notice here, this is just the commutative property it, with multiplication. But in one order, I can multiply, and in the other order, it's not even defined. So the com there's weirdness going on with the commutative property when dealing with matrices. It, it appears not to hold when we are multiplying them.
Now we come to the row column rule for computing AB. Pause the video if you want to read through all of that. But what it is is a uh, technique or a strategy. If I want to find a specific uh, location in a, the product of a matrix, like say you're working with really, really big matrices, 500 by 500, and you want you know what value is in some specific location of a product of two matrices, this is a, a means by which we can find that. So the ijth entry is found by taking the ith row row of A and the jth column of B, the ith and the jth, which is a weird thing to say, but we'll go with it, okay? So in the example, we need to find the entries in the second row of AB, where we're given the A and the B there. And so if you apply the concept above, where do those two entries come from, the second row of AB? Well, they come from the second row of matrix A, and then both columns of matrix B. So I'm just going to write down those two, but A, B would be equal to, let's see, some matrix here. Well, let's find out how big A, would, A B would be. Let's see, this is 4 by 3, excuse me, and this is 3 rows by 2 columns. Okay, so the product is defined because the threes are the same. And then what you find out is that interestingly, the four by two is the size of that product, four rows, two columns. Okay, so I'm gonna take my yellow highlighted row and multiply it by both columns of matrix B. So that negative one, three, negative four gets multiplied by the four, the seven, and the three. And I like to think of this as I kind of visually rotate that column next to the first column of B. And that would be, let's see, negative four, add 21, and then subtract 12. What is that gonna be? I think five, hopefully. I don't wanna make a mistake, but I'm pretty sure it's five. And then positive six, positive three, and minus eight. 6 and 3 is 9, minus 8 is 1. So 5, 1, that is the, uh, m the second row. There would be entries above and two entries below that. Okay, so for the purposes of our class, this process won't come up where you would need to find a specific row. We might, we're working with smaller matrices, uh, so we might as well just find the whole product. Uh, but th that does have its applications outside of linear algebra class. And now since I've just introduced multiplication as it relates to matrices, let's talk about its properties. So these are all of the properties that do apply to matrix multiplication. Uh, take a look through them, pause the video if you want to. Uh, we have an, a multiplicative identity, and that is the identity matrix. The identity matrix is the multiplicative identity. Um, and then we have, we can distribute a matrix over a sum from the left, and a matrix over a sum from the right. And notice inside of the parentheses, AB plus AC, B A plus C A, the A stayed on the left, the A stayed on the right. And then the, the big important point that I wanna make again is that matrix multiplication is not commutative. It is super not commutative. Um, the, that doesn't work. We can't just f change the order when dealing with matrix, matrix multiplication. Okay, and because of that, cancellation doesn't apply. So if I'm solving a matrix equation where A, B, and C are matrices, I can't just cancel out the A's. That's, that, that is a, a byproduct of this point that, that they're not a commutative. Okay? Uh, and then if I have a product of matrices equal to zero, that does not mean that one of the two matrices has to be zero. Like they, they don't, they could both be non-zero matrices, but their products still be zero. So that's like back when we were factoring and solving quadratics, right? That same concept doesn't apply here in linear algebra class with multiplication. Kind of cool. And then we can also raise matrices to powers. We're not going to do too much on this slide, uh, despite the giant size of the title. Um, but if I just want to take A to the kth power, that is A times A times et cetera times A, and then that would be K times, All right? So we can raise matrices to various powers. But what I want to add on to that, though, and probably should have written it first, is that A has to be, A is an N by N matrix. So that wouldn't work if A were a 3 by 4 matrix. 3 by 4 times a 3 by 4, that product is not defined. A would have to be a square matrix in order to raise it to some power.
And now the last main topic of this section is d defining what is called the transpose of a matrix. We have an M by N matrix A. The transpose is N by M. The notation we use is A with a superscript capital T. That stands for A transpose. And the columns are formed by the corresponding rows of the matrix A. What that means, what that looks like, is if I have my matrix A there, its transpose is A, B, C, D, like that. The, the rows become the columns, okay? Uh, or if I take B, transpose, first row becomes first column, second row becomes second column, third row becomes third column, all right? And then C transpose, is vertically one 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 because the ones are horizontal and now they're vertical that's a transpose negative three uh, five negative two and seven that's what transposes look like okay the rows become the columns and you could also think of it as the columns become the rows and last we talk about properties of transpose right the first one if you transpose a transpose you get the original matrix if you flip the rows and the columns and then you do it again you get what you started with Okay, uh, transposing a sum, so if I transpose a sum of two matrices, that is the same as transposing A and B first separately and then adding them together. If I have a scalar R, I can either transpose the product and mul multiply by the scalar first, or I can transpose the matrix first and then multiply by the scalar. And then the last one, that's the one I want you to like pay the closest attention to because that's not a typical property that we see. If I transpose a product, that is sa the same as transposing the matrices first and multiplying them, but notice how the order changes. So AB transpose is B transpose A transpose. The product of a the transpose of a product is equal to the product of the transposes, but in the reverse order. And that is the end of section 2.1 and the end of the video. Thank you very much for listening. Get started on your homework. Have a wonderful day.